Welcome. June 2014 has become the third successive month to post record high global temperatures. As you can see from this table, that this is primarily due to a warming of the oceans. So let's take a look at the temperature map and see what parts of the world have warmed and by how much. This map is divided into a series of squares. Each square subtends 5 degrees in latitude and 5 degrees in longitude. Now, for those of you that believe that the Earth is not warmed, I have one simple question. Is there more red or is there more blue in this picture? Red indicates warming, blue indicates cooling. And I should point out that this is with respect to a baseline stretching from 1980 to 2010. So that baseline itself has taken out about half the global warming that we've seen to date. Now we can take this simplistic form of analysis yet further. The darkest shade of blue represents record cold areas and the darkest shade of red indicates record warm areas. You will note that there are no dark blue areas on this map, yet there are over 100 dark red areas. This sort of imbalance is exactly what you would expect if there is strong warming. This plot compares the year to date figures for 2014 with the five previously warmest years on record. And you can see that 2014 is already solidly in third place. With a couple more record months like we've just had, then it's likely to shoot into first place. The equivalent precipitation map shows areas of both extreme rainfall and extreme drought. But there seems to be no particular pattern to it. Now let's take a look at sea ice, which for some obscure reason is always a contentious issue. Let's first take a look at the Arctic sea ice extent and we find that that was the sixth smallest on record. And from this graph, apart from there being very large year-to-year -year variations, we can see that this is part of a steady decline over the last 30 years. The reason why sea ice is often so contentious is that the southern hemisphere, the Antarctic, is showing a steady increase, although the variation is much more extreme than in the northern hemisphere. This causes us to ask ourselves several questions. Like, how do these two compare? What's the reasons behind this difference? And is the area of the sea ice what we actually should be comparing? Here you see a comparison of the trend in sea ice extent for the Arctic and Antarctic. The Antarctic is shown in red, the Arctic is shown in blue. Whereas the Antarctic shows a small trend, less than one sigma, over the last 30 years, the Arctic shows a trend that's twice as large, so therefore more significant. Something strange seems to be going on in the Antarctic. As you can see from this bottom frame, the actual area of sea ice is increasing. However, it's at a time when the surface temperature of the oceans there is also increasing. So we're getting more ice despite higher temperatures. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense. But is surface area what we should be comparing? Perhaps we should be comparing the actual volume of ice rather than the surface area. When we do that, we get a completely different picture. This graph shows the change in the volume of sea ice in the Arctic over the last few years. And you can see there's been a steady decline. Now let's take a look at the equivalent chart for the Antarctic. Note that this is not a plot of volume, but a plot of mass. And of course, to get to a volume, you'd just have to divide by the density of ice. But basically, over the last few years, the Antarctic has lost nearly a trillion tons of ice. But this is land ice, and therein lies the answer to our question of why the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic. With all this melting ice, fresh water is being deposited into the oceans. Now that water is warmer than the surrounding oceans and also lower salinity, so it will be less dense and tend to float on the surface. The lower the salinity level of the water, the easier it will freeze. So the surface water under these conditions is much more likely to freeze at a higher temperature. Now we have to add in one more factor, the ozone hole. Over Antarctica there's a very large ozone hole and ozone is a greenhouse gas. Thus, the air temperature above Antarctica is now lower than it was 30 years ago. And the lower temperature will make it more likely that the sea will freeze. There is a very much smaller ozone hole above the Arctic, so that is a much smaller effect. Although the ozone hole above the Antarctic is now beginning to repair itself, it's a very slow and long process and nonetheless is still there. 
Last, but by no means least, is the status of the La Nina El Nino cycle, which is so important to determine weather and climate around the world. At the moment, the sea surface temperature anomaly is still below 0.5, so technically we are in an ENSO neutral situation, which is all the more worrying that we are setting monthly record temperatures compared with years with strong El Ninos. The forecast of when we will actually have an El Nino has moved later. It's now predicted to be an 80% chance in the autumn or winter of this year. And if it does so, we'll be setting new high temperature records for each month. It is highly likely that 2014 will turn out to be the warmest year on record. If 2014 does take the top spot, then you'll notice the time between warmest years is accelerating. From 2014 to 2010 is four years, from 2005 to 2010 was five years, from 1998 to 2005 was seven years. I wonder how those that have been talking about a pause in global warming are going to deal with this situation.